Well, hello again, uh, everyone. Hope everyone's doing well and doing okay uh, today. Hope you've had a decent day so far. It's now quarter past five, according to my um, laptop here. So, um, hope you've had a good day so far. And again, it's just uh, I'm just going to do these sort of over this period where we have the uh, unfortunately have the coronavirus and there's people shut in and we're not able to actually meet as a church and have a service a proper service or anything so and meet I'm not able to meet people in homes um really it's been good to speak to somebody on the phone these past few days and just check in and hear how everyone's doing and um it was great to at least uh, do something yesterday uh, even though we couldn't have church uh so I, it was nice to be able to do that apologies again for my uh, uh challenges with technology but um, having run through it all on Thursday I still made the same mistake which Rosie pointed out so uh, thanks to Rosie or we probably would have not even had it at all so that that's helpful so, so I'll be well prepared for next Sunday in theory uh, just this morning so I to share something with you from uh, Acts the book of Acts in the New Testament uh, in all the years of preaching I find myself in Acts quite a lot I love the book of Acts and um just to see the early church and how they uh, spread the gospel, how they planted churches, how they uh, endured persecution, um, and just how they were, just their boldness uh, and their um, love of sharing their faith. But one of my favourite chapters, if I can say that, in Acts is Acts chapter 12, and I've preached in this a few times um, in various churches. Uh, and, and there's a few different reasons I love it, but I'll just read the whole chapter. Uh, or at least most of the chapter. So Acts chapter 12, um, and this is when we begin to see the church being persecuted uh, for their faith, as is ha still happening across the world, probably most countries across the world, or most continents, there's some form of persecution going on. Um, and uh, even if we're not facing it here in the same way, but Acts chapter 12 says, About that time, Herod the king laid violent hands on some who belonged to the church. He killed James, the brother of John, with the sword, and when he saw that it pleased the Jews, he proceeded to arrest Peter also. This was during the days of unleavened bread. And when he had seized him, he put him in prison, delivering him over to four squads of soldiers to guard him, intending after the Passover to bring him out to the people. So Peter was kept in prison, but earnest prayer was, for him was made to God by the church. Now when Herod was about to bring him out on that very night, Peter was sleeping between two soldiers, bound with two chains, and sentries before the door were guarding the prison. And behold, an angel of the Lord stood next to him, and a light shone in the cell. He struck Peter on the side and woke him, saying, Get up quickly. And the chains fell off his hands. And the angel said to him, Dress yourself and put on your sandals. And he did so, and he said to me, Wrap your cloak around you and follow me. And he went out and followed him. He did not know that what was being done by the angel was real but thought he was seeing a vision. When they had passed the first and the second guard, they came to the iron gate leading into the city. It opened for them of its own accord, and they went out and went along one street, and immediately the angel left him. When Peter came to himself, he said, Now I am sure that the Lord has sent his angel and rescued me from the hand of Herod and from all that the Jewish people were expecting. When he realised this, he went to the house of Mary, the mother of John, whose other name was Mark, where many were gathered together and were praying. And when he knocked at the door, of the gateway, a servant girl named Rhoda came to answer. Recognising Peter's voice in her joy, she did not open the gate, but ran in and reported that Peter was standing at the gate. They said to her, you're out of your mind, but she kept insisting that it was so, and they kept saying, it is his angel. But Peter continued knocking, and when they opened, they saw him and were amazed, but motioning to them with his hand to be silent. He described to them how the Lord had brought him out of the prison. And he said, tell these things to James and to the brothers. Then he departed and went to another place. Now when day came, there was no little disturbance among the soldiers over what had become of Peter. And after Herod searched for him and did not find him, he examined the sentries and ordered that they should be put to death. Then he went down from Judea to Caesarea and spent time there. Now Herod was angry with the people of Tyre and Sidon, and they came to him with one accord. And having persuaded Blastus, the king's chamberlain, they asked for peace because their country depended on the king's country for food. On an appointed day, Herod put on his royal robes, took a seat upon the throne and, delivering an oration to, and delivered an oration to them. And the people were shouting, the voice of a god and not of a man. Immediately an angel of the Lord struck him down, because he did not give God the glory. And he was eaten by worms and breathed his last. But the word of God increased and multiplied. So I read the whole chapter there, but 
um, and there's lots you could pull out of there, obviously. Uh, but one of the things that is re- that really struck me when I was reading that this morning, uh, just thinking of our own situation and our own uh, circumstances at the moment uh, as as a church and as believers. Not that we're being persecuted in the UK for our faith, that's not happening, or not certainly not to the degree that you know you have uh, James being killed and Peter imprisoned. Uh, but but what really uh, struck me was just uh, the power of prayer, the power of prayer in this in this place, because you see that Peter is imprisoned. And what we're told in verse 5 is that so Peter was kept in prison, but earnest prayer for him was made to God by the church. And then he tells this story about how God sends an angel to lead, free Peter, lead him out of the prison uh, and take him to safety, basically. Uh, and Luke's writing that, Luke who wrote Acts, obviously also wrote Luke, is trying to show us that um, prayer was used here in order to um, free Peter. And so Peter comes to himself. He, he then goes to the place uh, where a group of people are praying. So we go down to verse 12. It says, when Peter realised that what he had seen wasn't just a vision or a dream or something, which you, let's be honest, you probably would think um, you were maybe going mad or having a vision or a dream or something. And when he realised this, he went to the house of Mary, the mother of John, this is in verse 12, whose other name was Mark, where many were gathered together and were praying. Now, I think what we're led to believe here is that... Um, in verse five, we're told that earnest prayer was made to Peter by the church. Now, I think it's, I think what they're doing here in this prayer meeting is certainly praying for Peter. They'll be praying for him. And what happens is uh, Peter shows up at that door while they're praying. And the hilarious thing is they, they can't believe it when Rhoda goes and says, oh, look, Peter's at the door. You know, the guy we're praying for to be freed or I assume praying for to be freed or whatever they're praying for. Um, even though they're probably praying for that, they can't believe that it's happened. You know, the answer to the prayer is standing at the door, but they can't believe that that's happened. But anyway, the, the thing that really hit me was that these people are just in a house, and they're probably a small group of people who are afraid to go out for different reasons than us. They're afraid to go out because of the persecution, because of what's happened to the other disciples. Um, uh, or, or I, I assume they're afraid to go out. Maybe it doesn't clearly state that, but I think we can. It'd be safe to say they've no idea what to do. You know, um, obviously, uh, yeah. That one of the uh, James has been killed and Peter's in jail, and they're meeting and they're praying together. At, at this point in their faith and in their church, they they wouldn't be. I don't think they'd be feeling particularly strong. They wouldn't be feeling particularly powerful. Uh, just in this house together praying, probably not really knowing what to do. But yet God uses that group of people. And he uses their prayers in order to do something absolutely incredible, in order to demonstrate his power, in order to demonstrate what he can do, and in order to free Peter uh, from these um, from this prison cell. I think that's fantastic. And, and to me, it just shows uh, the power of prayer. It's something we underestimate. It's something that as Christians, we I, I certainly know I underestimate. And we, can, um, we certainly wouldn't say this, but we can devalue it at times. And... For many of us in our church, our little church in Stonehaven, uh, we're not able to do all the meetings we would normally want to do. Not, some of us are having to isolate because of health problems uh, or, or just the fear of you know catching something and being vulnerable to uh, the illness. Others are um, you know choosing to isolate in other ways uh, in order to protect others out of love for others. Uh, and I, I'm aware that there's people in the church who are, you know, working around the clock as well, and uh, because they because they have to. And um, so, but what I mean is that there's many of us who are just at home, uh, not able to do as many things that we used to be able to do. Perhaps are feeling we can't do as much, even do as much for God. Um, and yeah, I think we should really use this as a time. And I'm challenging myself here more than anyone else uh, to devote to prayer, devote to prayer, and say, well. We might just be in our house here. It's just me and Rosie and and we Talitha, and, and but prayer is powerful, and God can use that. And it's amazing. Prayer is powerful uh, because it takes us to God, who um, the Bible says is able to do immeasurably more uh, than we can possibly ask or imagine. Um, so, so be much in prayer, and and don't. Maybe this is part of the reason God has us as believers in the house a lot more is is um, taking away some of the normal things that we do in order to. To devote time to prayer and to, to pray for the people around us, uh, pray for our church, pray for um, people in our communities that are struggling and um, uh, need the Lord and uh, 
to pray for our government, to pray for the world, and look outside of our own country as well, and, and to others, um, and to and not underestimate what what God can do through that, and um, to think of think of others outside ourselves, but but really devote ourselves to 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 prayer. So I would encourage you. I'm challenging myself on that, and I encourage us all as a church um, to be uh, to be more in prayer, uh, because that is the one thing that all of us can do any time, any place. Um, and to continue to pray for one another and again don't underestimate what God can do through that so I hope that's helpful I hope that's encouraging uh, to you and um, I'll speak to you all more during the week I'm sure and um, I'll probably send around more of these uh, as they come to my mind so uh, thanks again and praying for everyone and hope everyone's doing well